Right. Hello, everyone. I'm Massey. I'm from uh, the Bedrock team. Uh, I'm from the Bedrock team, uh, responsible for building and expanding a network indexer. I'm here to talk to you about how to become a network, uh, an index provider. Sorry about the type on the slide. Uh, what is an index provider? You know, is this concept has been mentioned a few times, so what, what is it really? So index provider is nothing but a content provider that does two things. So one is um, the, the content provider that, um, okay, so uh, a content provider that has an index of all the multi-hashes that it contains and then um, shares that list of multi-hashes to the network, so tells everybody what multi-hashes it has. And the second thing that it does is it tells the network how to retrieve it. Right, so this is the key difference between a content provider and an index provider. Uh, an, index, uh, an index provider is a content provider that tells everybody about its multi hashes and teaches them how to retrieve them. So what is the general overall uh, process of um, providing indices? Right? So at first we have some content. That content goes into a process of uh, generating advertisements, which I'll go to in a minute. Uh, the advertisements that are generated are stored uh, in a local file system, advertisements themselves are nothing but content. Um, they're all addressable. And then that uh, content provider would make an announcement to the network saying, hey, I've got this stuff. Right? So uh, from now on, I'm going to dive deeper into each of these components and talk about how they work, what they're made of. Uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about is what is an advertisement. Advertisement is basically a, a piece of information that contains uh, uh, a link to the previous advertisement. I'll come, to back, come, come back to that in a minute. The ID of the provider in terms of peer ID. Uh, it contains addresses, i.e. where you can contact this uh, provider. Right there you can see how you can construct something like an ad info from provider and addresses. It has a signature, so that verifies that it's actually the provider that provided the record. It has some link to the entries and uh, a context ID, metadata, and a Boolean to say whether this advertisement is about uh, removing content or adding content. Uh, every, uh, so before I go any deeper, I want to just point out that every data structure I talk about here, this is all IPLD. So we try to use IPLD wherever we can, and everything we talk about has IPLD schemas. You find links at the bottom of the screen that points you to the IPLD schema, so you can have a look at those and uh, you know, uh, understand how they work. So how does these advertisements uh, kind of connect to each other? So here we have a picture of uh, an advertisement chain, which uh, I think Andrew had earlier in his slides. Uh, as you can see, you have an advertisement, you had, you, which has a, a list of uh, fields that I mentioned earlier. It has a link to the previous advertisement. That link may or may, may not be present. Uh, the absence of that, uh, that link means that we have reached the end of that tree of uh, chain of advertisements. And it also has links to entries. So entries is the actual thing that contains the list of multi-hashes we're trying to advertise as a content provider. Uh, so entries themselves can uh, contain a chain. I'll go to uh, deeper into entries themselves in a minute and explain the type of different types of entries. So uh, when it comes to entries, we have two kinds of entries. One is uh, an entry chunk. Uh, we call it entry chunk, which is basically an array of bytes. Uh, and remember, multi-hashes are nothing but bytes. Uh, it's just a, a multi-codec code and a digest. Uh, and it has a link to the next. Right? So uh, uh, in the entry chunk type, you can see that uh, how the multi-hashes could be contained in a single message. Right? And the, way, the point of having a next link is that at some point you will hit the limits of the message size, for example. So uh, providing a next link is a way for us to chunk these. So it's a way for us to basically implement some pagination mechanism on top of uh, IPLD data. The other type of uh, entries that we could have uh, is HAMT. And HAMT is a advanced data layer in IPLD. It's actually a uh, prefixed tree map. It's, it's a way for you uh, to define a map. Um, uh, so uh, this is a very recent addition. Uh, you can find the specification of HAMT in the link below. Uh, the point of using HAMT, uh, so, um, uh, now I'm going to talk about what is the difference. What, why, why would you choose one entry chunk, uh, entry chunk versus HAMT, right? So when we started building Index Provider, we started with uh, entry chunk. It's nice and simple. You have just a list of multi-hashes. It's all chained together. Great, right? It's, it's really easy to understand. But 
uh, the, it, it comes with a problem. So for example, when you want to divide up multi-hashes across multiple shards or multiple uh, nodes, this uh, connects to the stuff that Will mentioned earlier in terms of next steps, in terms of decentralizing network indexer and having a distributed network indexer. Uh, you really can't use entry chunks. Uh, you, you really can't separate multi-hashes by something like prefix or anything until you have traversed the entire depth of uh, multi-hashes. Now you can imagine if every node in the network wants to do that, this is a very expensive operation. So we want to provide a simpler way for us to slice and dice multi-hashes and a way for us to quickly find out what are the multi-hashes in this specific link that I'm as an indexer responsible for. Uh, that's where HAMT comes in. So uh, the, the way that HAMT is used in index prov provider is actually used as a set. Uh, HAMT itself is a map. So we use it as a set where the key is the multi-hashes and the value is always set to something simple like true. Uh, and uh, the, the entire uh, multi-hashes are basically sorted by prefixed. Uh, you have a prefix tree. You have a really nice and efficient way of finding out which multi-hashes exist in a, in a link. Uh, but it does have this disadvantages. It's a bit comp more complicated to work with. Uh, it's all built on very, very new and uh, fresh implementations of uh, IPLD HAMPs. Uh, which are still under development, but it has a uh, huge potential and opens up a huge array of uh, design decisions for us to make in the future uh, if we have a hamt based um, entry um, structure. I touched on metadata. So what is metadata in, the, in an advertisement? Uh, if you remember, I, I started by saying a, a index provider is a content provider that tells everybody about the multi-hashes that it stores and also tells them how, to, um, how, to, uh, how the content could be retrieved. Metadata is the thing that captures how the content could be retrieved. Uh, the metadata itself is, again, designed to be extremely extensible. Uh, the only structure that it has is it starts with a protocol ID um, and it has an optional uh, bytes at, uh, after protocol ID, which defines you know, whatever protocol you would like to define. So today you could invent your own special way of uh, uh, fetching information and have your own metadata and you know, there's, there's nothing stopping you from that, you can, you can define it. There are two uh, specific uh, metadata types that are defined today. Uh, one is um, transport over uh, bit swap. So uh, you can see uh, links to the multi-codec uh, CSV table there. You can see these codes inside the CSV table. And then the second one is graph sync for Filecoin v1 data. Uh, the, first, uh, the first type of um, uh, protocol ID bit swap really doesn't have any byte at the end of it because as long as, as soon as you know an endpoint supports bit swap, the rest is simple. You just ask for uh, SIDs and get, you get blocks back. It's, it's extremely simple. There's nothing else to do there. But when it comes to something like graph sync over Filecoin, you have um, more information that you require in order to instantiate a um, uh, retrieval of data. So what is that information? So here I've, uh, sh I'm showing you the IPLD schema of what is the structure of bytes inside the metadata for um, advertisements that support uh, graph sync Filecoin v1 retrieval. And as you can see, it has things like PCID, uh, whether it's a verified deal or not, whether it's fast retrieval or not. And this uh, metadata then makes sense to something like Lotus uh, and Boost, and then that would enable you to retrieve uh, information. Uh, there are links at the bottom that point to IPLD schema and the Go uh, documentation package. You can have a look at that. So we talked about advertising information, advertising content. So how do we tell people that, hey, I no longer have this, or what would happen if my address changes, you know? Uh, because I need, I've told people that, hey, I, I have this, this multi-hash and you can get it from this address, what should I do if my address changes? So the structure of advertisements supports two specific fields that allow you to uh, modify advertised uh, content. One is context ID, the other one is a Boolean field called is removed. So, Context ID is, a, is a basically a unique identifier that um, identifies the provider and the metadata. Uh, you can think of it as a way of grouping multi-hashes together. Uh, so I think Andrew earlier touched on this. So imagine if you want to remove a whole bunch of multi-hashes that you've advertised, you really don't want to advertise the multi-hashes multi again just to say this is the removal, you know, remove these multi-hashes. Instead, you can tag them, if you like, with a context ID, and you just say, hey, remove context ID X, and all the multi-hashes associated with that context ID uh, are going to be removed. Is remove, uh, like I mentioned, uh, it's a field inside advertisement. 
And whether it's set to true or not defines whether the content is being added or is being removed. Uh, in a case where you would like to change the metadata associated uh, address and metadata uh, associated to, uh, content without removing it, um, again, we don't want to advertise all the multi hashes again just to do that. Uh, so there is a specific no content SID that you could use as a link to entries and then simply include uh, the context ID with the new address and new, met new metadata. And as soon as that advertisement is published, uh, then the indexer node would change the information associated to that uh, context ID. Uh, so, so far we talked about generating advertisements, right? What is the, what is the actual fundamental data structure that we, we need to produce as an index provider? And now we're going to talk about how do you tell the network about it so that uh, an indexer node can then come and ingest the information and make it available to the world and make it actually findable. Uh, so the, the, the point where we tell the network, we call it announcement. An announcement uh, basically includes two things. One is, what is the head of advertisement? If you if you remember, I showed you advertisement chain that is interconnected. So uh, the head of advertisement, it means the, the latest set of advertisement entry that exists in the chain. Uh, and the second one is the publisher address, as in where can I retrieve this uh, multi-hashes from, right? So uh, the, the announcement themselves could be made in two different channels. So you can isol either use uh, gossip sub to publish this information, and you can also use explicit put request to the um, uh, index provider uh, via uh, announce URL. Uh, you know, and examples of providers that use different uh, uh, avenues here are, for example, Lotus and Boost are using the gossip sub network to disseminate information about these announcements, uh, whereas something like NFC Storage is making explicit puts uh, to the current indexer to notify that, hey, I've got a new advertisement, come get it. Right? Uh, there's one subtle point here um, I wanted to point out. So there's this concept of publisher that exists, and publisher could be different from the, con uh, from the content provider or from the index provider, if you like. Um, uh, but um, that basically means you can delegate publication of advertisements to a separate uh, process. That could be a powerful yet potentially complicated uh, concept that allows you to basically scale your system if the thing that is uh, providing content doesn't have the capacity or wants to isolate or separate the task of publishing advertisements. So you could do that, but it, uh, it comes with a specific clause that hopefully we will make um, you know, less important later on. But for now, the IDs need to be explicitly uh, whitelisted. Uh, if the publisher and uh, index provider use different identities, because advertisements have signature, then it means totally new sits. So you, we are creating a different chain of advertisements, if you like, which is something to consider. So you know, in a typical case, you can imagine identities could be shared, and that way the chain of advertisements produced by the publisher and by the actual provider would be identical. Uh, so what are the interfaces for uh, an index provider, i.e., how does uh, a network indexer connect to the index provider to then ingest the information? So there's actually two different interfaces that uh, could exist. One is HTTP, it is extremely simple. Uh, the other one is GraphSync. On the HTTP endpoint, uh, you simply have a um, endpoint that exposes the head advertisement, and you also have an endpoint that given a SID returns the, blocks, uh, return, returns the block associated to that SID in form of uh, JSON. Um, on the GraphSync side, you, have, you can have combination of uh, gossip sub or HTTP for publication of announcements that I talked about, and a good old-fashioned graph sync and, uh, server that allows you to just simply fetch uh, the sits, fetch blocks associated to sits. Uh, so uh, the links that you see on the right-hand side, these are the libraries that implement uh, the graph sync with uh, basically graph sync interface that you can use. Uh, again, Andrew kindly pointed on, uh, on these in his um, presentation earlier. Uh, so on the implementations, uh, the, there is one, currently one implementation of uh, index provider. It's written in uh, Go. Uh, it is uh, written to be two things at once. Uh, there are historical reasons for that. One is uh, be a standalone index provider. Uh, you can use it to basically expose an endpoint and uh, give it car files, it, which it would then publish to the network and say, hey, I have the content in this car file. Uh, initially built that to test the network indexer, but now it's available for anybody who would like to use it. 
The other side is SDKs that allows you to embed uh, network, uh, sorry, index providers inside your Go application and, and basically build your own uh, thing. Uh, this library is used by um, uh, Filecon in, in Boost and Lotus. Um, it's used by Estuary. There's a whole bunch of uh, clients that are using this. Uh, the URL at the bottom is where you can uh, find the information. I want to quickly mention a Rust implementation of uh, HTTP uh, interface, which is written by Marco sitting over there, um, which is excellent. So excellent to see. And you know, one thing I'd love to see is just multiple implementation, implementations of index provider in different languages because you know it's, it's the best way to kind of figure out wrinkles in the protocol and make sure it's actually making sense for everybody. Uh, in terms of tooling, uh, the index provider library also provides a CLI tool that allows you to basically um, interact with an index provider regardless of um, what it is written in as long as it follows the uh, network indexer protocol. So uh, the things you can do with the provider CLI is you can uh, list advertisements from a provider given its uh, multi-adder. Uh, you can verify ingestion. Uh, you can use it to run an index provider in a st standalone way uh, called daemon that then takes car files and basically publishes them to the network. Uh, I wanted to dive a little bit deeper into this tool and talk about having written an index provider, no matter in what language, whether with index provider library or not, how would you verify that it actually worked? So you can use the index provider CLI to uh, verify that it is working. So with index provider CLI, you can check, you can list the advertisements that exist in the um, exists in a provider. So here you see an example of a um, command, ls list advertisements from a provider multi-adder. And what you see is an output that shows the uh, seed of the advertisement, the seed of the previous advertisement, the ID of the provider, addresses that are included in the advertisement, and whether it isn't removed or not. And in the background, a bit of a uh, process that is gone and actually fetched all the entries in the advertisement, it says it's made of five chunks. So chunks means that this is actually an entry chunk chain. And in total, it has 72,000-ish uh, multi-hashes. So how would you verify that a published advertisement is actually ingested by an indexer? Again, uh, index provider uh, CLI provides you with a tool that allows you to verify ingestion. So the command you see here is verify verifying that um, uh, Advertise uh, the multi hashes from a provider. So um, I'll get into that in a minute. But multi hashes from a provider to seed.contact, which is so happens to be the endpoint of a network indexer today, um, only recurs once. So you can recursively walk the chain of advertisements to find out which multi hashes exist. The minus a speed that you see there is randomly sampling 10% of the multi hashes. You might not want to verify the ingestion of every single multi hash there. So it uh, allows you to support random sampling. And the PID at the end tells the in CLI what should be the expected uh, client uh, peer ID for um, any index records that I would find in the index. And then as you can see, uh, the output shows you, you know, how many multi-hashes are verified, uh, you know, uh, how many were unindexed. Uh, the output is actually quite long. It gives you things like, uh, numerical distribution over number of multi-hashes and things like that if you do uh, recursively. Uh, but I haven't added it here. Please go and have a play with it. Uh, in terms of uh, minus minus FB, you can actually get multi-hashes from different sources. Uh, so if you think about it, the advertisement chain is just a source of a list of multi-hashes, right? And a list of multi-hashes could come from a car file, could come from just a detached car index. So uh, all three of those are supported by the provider CLI. You can just point it at the source of, source of multi-hashes. It goes and extracts the multi-hashes and verifies ingestion. Uh, some, a little bit of stats on SID.contact because this is a question that came up earlier when Andrew was giving a talk. So uh, right now we have 172 providers on SID.contact. About 26% of them are uh, Filecoin providers. Uh, and in the last seven days, we have ingested about 5 billion uh, multi-hashes. Um, you can see the list of all the providers that exist in the seed.contact using that URL. Uh, and uh, what you would see is things like uh, seed of the latest advertisement that is uh, processed, when was it processed, what is the peer ID, and so on. And uh, you know, it, it just shows you the entire list of all the uh, providers that exist today. 
So what are the next steps for index providers? So uh, like I mentioned, uh, the HAMT work is just as, at its infancy. So uh, it's, um, it is implemented both on the uh, store the index side. So store the index understand links that point to HAMT. Uh, on the index provider side, it is also implemented in that you can produce advertisements with um, kind um, HAMT as entry. Uh, what, what we do want to do in the next step is basically dog fooding. So we want to uh, mm -hmm. basically write our own software that publishes ha a lot of HAMTs mm -hmm. and make sure that it's actually working. Uh, this also connects into the uh, work stream in terms of decentralizing the network indexer. Uh, as part of verifying the HAMT, uh, we are developing a, a indexer mirror, if you like. So you can imagine, because the list, the chain of advertisements from providers is completely open and public, so I can uh, technically download that chain, reshape it and change it, and then republish it uh, myself or identically republish it, uh, a bit like a CDN. Uh, so that's, uh, we are actually working on a tool on index provider that allows you to mirror providers and uh, potentially remap the advertisement chain into HAMT, for example. There's a whole bunch of open questions. I've uh, trimmed it down. Um, Will touched on a few, Andrew touched on a few. So uh, there's a whole a rich uh, wealth of open and difficult questions in index provider. Uh, on the in, uh, index provider specifically though, on, on the in, uh, network indexer, on the index provider specifically, you have things like um, how long should uh, a, pub, uh, a published advertisement remain or be servable by the uh, index provider? And how long should it be uh, discoverable uh, having been ingested by an indexer? Uh, so you can imagine a world where you know, there is like a decaying function or something that requires republication of advertisements and that could solve a lot of problems in terms of uh, garbage collection and uh, things like that, both uh, garbage collection and distribution of uh, workload. Uh, the uh, other stuff that we want to talk about is um, what should be the limit on uh, advertisements published by an index, uh, index provider? Where should we say that, hey, you are big enough to be two index providers, please, because you know it would be easier to fit you in a distributed sharded network. So you could have different ways of doing that, say by the depth of um, advertisement chain or uh, you know the amount of multi hashes that are published. These are all techniques that we are thinking about. All relates to the um, work stream about how can we make a planetary scale uh, network index or index providers. Uh, a quick set of links for you to try. There is an example for the uh, index provider SDK Go, Go SDK that you can try. Um, like Will mentioned, there's uh, also a Filecoin uh, Slack channel that you can post any questions with. Uh, last but not least, uh, all you see here is a work of a team. Um, uh, more specifically, Will and Andrew, bedrock team that is willing to integrate all of this into our application as well as the rest of the PL uh, network. So thank you all. I'll have any questions that you might, I'll take any questions that you might have. Right. So the first question I would ask is what language is the provider is being written in? And if it's Go, I would immediately would point you to the example, the list you can see, the link you can see on the on the page. And that example is basically stands up uh, a index provider engine and then uh, publishes a simple advertisement. Right. Uh, and it also uh, shows you how you can hook up your own way of listing multi ashes because it's really the, the, the thing that we want to make, make is extensible when it comes to providing libraries for index providers is everybody stores their multi ashes and list of files differently. So how can we build it so that it is agnostic of say Lotus or Boost, um, it is agnostic of IPFS itself, it just uh, works, you know? So I would recommend looking at that uh, example. Uh, if it's not a Go um, uh, client, uh, I'll point you to documentations on uh, Soda Index, which talks to talks about 
what are the protocols uh, in terms of uh, providing uh, indices? So there are, there's two. One is the, what is the IPLD schema? Uh, you can find the link in my slides. And the other one is what is the protocol for HTTP? Uh, there's a more detailed document on what is the HTTP protocol on stored index under doc. Marco. Are any providers uh, publishing AMPs yet? Uh, not yet, no. Not that we know of. Yeah, but I, I need to look at the logs. But uh, the options are there in the index provider, so you can configure it to publish HAMPs. We wanted to be the first people to publish it, just to make sure it's working all good. But yeah, not yet. Juan. Uh, maybe given that we have a few um, uh, pending service folks like here, it may be useful to just have a workshop where you do kind of like you go through adding any services to the indexer. Yeah. Sounds good. Sounds good. I'll, I'll see if I can put the content together. Yeah. I think the real question is, there, there's sort of two options. There's like native integration of this sort of protocol, or waiting for IPFS to have reframe publishing, and then we'll have likely a sidecar mm. type thing where IPFS can publish to something that looks a lot like this through that reframe protocol and then it, it ends up as a provider. It, it might be really useful to just get, get into the habit of getting other people to write other tools that ingest other content and publish it through. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, people will learn that they can do that, and they'll think that everything has to go through Google. And so um, like, even probably even after Reframing Labs, I would still kind of, for, for groups running large-scale systems, um, in the way them running a separate tool. Yeah. And, and if there's already a database somewhere else, those decisions it's way more difficult to work with that. Yeah. Like, so circuitous sort of reframe. Yeah. yeah. So no more questions. Thank you. Here's the